A very warm welcome to this Rayworth's Harrogate Literature Festival event. It's part of the Harrogate International Festivals and a particular thanks to Rayworth's LLP solicitors for sponsoring the festival. More so this year than ever, we owe them a huge amount. This is a free event, so if you'd like to donate to the festival, you can online. My name is Matt Stadlin. I'm a presenter, a producer, I'm a writer, I'm even a photographer, a nature photographer. I've got my own book about birds, how to see birds, that is still out now. And it's a delight for me to introduce to you Alexandra Shulman. She was editor-in-chief of British Vogue for a quarter of a century between 1992 and 2017. And we're going to be talking about her book, Clothes and Other Things That Matter. Alexandra, welcome to you. This is such a, a difficult time for so many of us. And I think it's really, really important that these sorts of cultural exchanges continue, albeit largely digitized on Zoom throughout this period. Well, thanks, thanks, Matt, for, for having me and so pleased to be part of it. And yes, absolutely. I mean, everything that we can possibly do to, to keep our culture going, whether that be um, talks like this, whether it be plays, whether it be concerts. I think one of the things we've really learned in the last, whatever it is, six, nine months, is how much one appreciates having that kind of input in your life. And so important to be able to kind of hear other people, see other things, get ideas. It's one of the things I found the most frustrating about lockdown was not being able to go to an art gallery, um, not being able to go to a play because you become very kind of internalized and thinking about yourself if you aren't able to get out and see what ideas other people have come up with. These events, I mean, I've done a lot of them throughout the summer when we're recording this in, in sort of late September, just as we're about to go into some sort of semi-lockdown again. But, but they are important because they enable us to exchange views and, and ideas and continue to create a, a sense of community. They're not quite the same thing, though, as being on stage. You know, as a host for those sorts of events, live events, I love it because you're able to create an atmosphere, you're able to look, look at the audience, look at the people that you're serving or, or entertaining, and somehow together there's a great excitement. It's like when you go to a classical music concert or, or the theatre, it's different from listening to a recording because you don't know what's going to go right and what's going to go wrong. There's this great sense of possibility and a little bit of a sense of, of, sense of danger. Yeah, I contribute to um, a, a digital magazine called Airmail, which was started by the guy who used to edit Vanity Fair. And in the last, um, last issue of it, there was a piece by the very, very good uh, theatre critic, John La, about going to see, at the Bridge Theatre in London, going to see the David Hare monologue that Ray Fiennes had been doing. And um, although it was a piece about the play, it made this really interesting point about when you go to the theatre and it's live, the play changes every night because the audience are part of the play and that the actors react to the audience and the audience react to each other. And, you know, that's so true about live events and, and something like um, this festival, you know, if, we, if we'd been able to be in a place together with an audience in front of us, I'm sure my reactions to and answers would have been not different, but maybe the way I phrase them, or I'd be able to see somebody going to sleep in the corner and I'd think, okay, speed up, or I'd see somebody looking really enthusiastic and I'd think, yeah, you know, that's working. Whereas you don't get that feedback. So your, your performance, as it were, and the content changes. And it's slightly different as far as chemistry between interviewer and interviewee goes. I mean, you can sort of develop some sort of connection over Zoom, but it's not quite the same thing, is it? No, it's not the same thing. But, you know, at least we've got Zoom, hey? <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> where would we be? <laughs> exactly. Let's accentuate the positives. So you've written this book. It was out earlier this year. Strange time to, to bring out a, a book on clothes and fashion. Have you enjoyed the experience, though? I've loved um, publishing the book. Uh, it was very frustrating to publish a book, any book, I think, um, 
when I did, which was April the 23rd, so about a month after we'd gone into lockdown, which was kind of the epicenter of the worst time to publish, because I think uh, by the end of the lockdown, people were beginning to start buying books anyway, because they were kind of getting fed up with watching Netflix. But just when, when I came out, um, everyone was just really, you know, watching the news and listening to the radio, live radio and everything. So uh, it was frustrating in that way and not being able to go to the bookshops and do talks or even to see your book in a bookshop. That was horrible. But oddly enough, um, one way and another, because of that, a lot of other opportunities grew up about ways you could talk about it, reach people. And in fact, the book sold really well when it, when it first came out. I was very lucky. And so it's been frustrating in a way, but, but not impossible. I don't think it really mattered what the subject matter was. I mean, the week that I was, um, I made it into the top 10 one week and it was interesting. I was kind of, you know, flanked, I think, by Tyson Fury and um, a book about gardening. So clearly, you know, clothes, Fury and gardens were all something people were interested in at that point. But it's interesting as well though, Alexandra, because when the book came out, there was this huge emphasis on the struggle and, and, and the fact that we were in this together. And of course, we've seen that we're in this together to very different degrees and, and likely the poorest, as usually happens, are, are hit the hardest. And in that sense, quite, quite challenging to, to bring out a book about fun, about colour, about clothes, about how we look at that moment. But on the other hand, the upside is that people actually, I, I suspect, wanted and continue to want a bit of distraction from the news and from, from the gloom, from the death toll, from the struggle that, to some extent or other, we all have experienced at whatever end of the, the, the scale we are and so there's a sort of there's a bit of a sense of, of light relief I think to the book and to talking about clothes and to being allowed as human beings to continue to enjoy the fun things in life. Yeah there are a couple of things about that I think if it had been a book about what to wear um, or fashion really pure fashion that would have been harder but because it was about the other things that matter, as well as the clothes. Um, there was a lot, there's a lot in it about um, emotions, because it's really about what clothes make you feel and my own experiences of clothes. So that's kind of about, you know, the workplace, being a mother, ambition, um, friendship, all of those things. So I think those kind of more emotional um, sort of touchstones are something people were interested in and are interested in. But also, oddly enough, everyone was a bit obsessed at that point about what people were wearing because it was kind of like, well, are you bothering to get dressed? You know, have you been in your pajamas all day? Are you wearing a tracksuit all the time? So one of the things about clothes was I was able to kind of talk about actually how clothes do make you feel good. There's only so many days you can get up and just put an old t-shirt on and feel really good about yourself. They can make you feel good, they can make you feel bad, they can make you feel a whole range of emotions, can't they? They, they, they can make you feel everything, but they are also just part of your, um, part of your personal map, really, part of your personal history. So every time you put something on, or quite often when you put something on, you kind of have a bit of a memory about what happened the last time you wore it. And lots of my clothes anyway, I've had for a long time. And they, they you know, they bring with them kind of different stories and they, they make you feel different ways. And I think that's one of the things against fast fashion. I mean, one of the many things against fast fashion is that if you just buy stuff and then chuck it out, it never accrues this kind of resonance and, um, and worth that, keeping something does to you personally. And the nostalgia. Absolutely, the nostalgia. Um, but it's not just nostalgia. It's not just a thing whereby you look back and you think, oh, you know, I used to do that. It's also a kind of, I think it has a kind of an animus about it, certain clothing. It kind of propels you into to doing things or expectations maybe of what's going to happen if you you wear it so i don't think it's just looking back i think it's quite um an in the present 
thing, your reaction to, to what you're wearing. Do you have clothes that you feel most comfortable in, a kind of uniform? I mean, obviously, we have different clothes for different environments, different occasions, but my fallback attire, I guess, is this sort of thin blue jumper, which is from Uniqlo, and it kind of just does be fine. Yeah, you and... Um... Which one was it? Well, it was Steve Jobs, right, that always had the turtleneck. And then Barack Obama always had the same navy blue suit. So, you know, it's a, it's a guy thing, I think, always finding the one thing that works and, and sticking with it. No, I don't have that. Actually, I'm really schizophrenic. So today I'm wearing this kind of patterned dress. It's a silk dress. Yesterday I was wearing jeans and a black T-shirt. And that's kind of what I mean, that actually today... It's very sunny here today. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to kind of dress up one because I was doing this, and two because actually I thought I was feeling quite good mood today, quite optimistic, and so I chose to put this on. Yesterday was a bit more of a kind of utilitarian day. I find it quite hard to wake up in the morning. You know, I just pulled on what was the easiest thing. So when I saw you for the first time before we started recording, it, immediately a smile came to my face just because of the sheer fun, the joie de vivre of your clothes. So they reflect the mood that you were in before you put them on, but do they also sort of entrench that mood as well? Um, yeah, I, I really believe they do. I really believe that clothes, um, you know, they are physically on you. They touch you all the time. Uh, they're the thing that you, when people see, as you just said, when people see you, it's the first thing they can see is your clothes. I mean, so you can lie to them through clothes, you know, but it's a way of giving a message about yourself. And I think that they do, they make, they, they do affect your behavior to, to quite a large extent. Um, and that's, I guess, what interested me when I was writing the book. I was kind of feeling my way through how to write about clothes and also how to write about Vogue because I didn't want to write a memoir, but I knew people would be interested in Vogue. So, you know, by taking different items of clothing and seeing actually the effect that that had on me and that I've observed on other people, that was, I thought, quite an interesting way to do it. Well, then you started as a kind of starting point to the book by counting your clothes. And I think it's fair to say, perhaps it won't surprise people watching and listening, that you have quite a lot of clothes. There are a lot of knickers, a lot of bras, a huge number of shoes, lots of handbags. <laughs> yes, not to mention nine gloves, oddly enough. <laughs> and um, seven leggings and 37 handbags, indeed. It is quite a lot. It, what, but, on earth, what on earth do you do with them all? They're stuffed into cupboards and drawers everywhere, including my poor son's bedroom, which has got, you know, a whole cupboard of my clothes in. Um, but I think if anyone counted their clothes, actually counted every single thing, they would come up with a way longer list than, than they thought they would. It's surprisingly difficult to get rid of clothes. I mean, I've donated clothes to charity shops and so forth in the past, but when I have a clear out, there are some items of clothing, we mentioned nostalgia briefly earlier, that I just don't want to give up on because I've had that t-shirt for 20 years or 25 years. And I remember when I had it and it's now got holes here and holes everywhere, but I associate it with say being really comfortable in bed and I just don't want to let go. And there yeah. are other things as well that sort of, that, that, that could help you create a variety in your wardrobe that you know you will rarely use and are really difficult to let go of. I think you should never get rid of something if you feel even the slightest smidgen of not wanting to get rid of it. I can also guarantee that as soon as you give something away, you'll want it for something, whatever. I mean, it happens every single time to me, you know, something I haven't worn for years and then I give it to Oxfam and a month later I'm thinking, oh, I really like to wear that green skirt. And then I ah, gave it away, just gave it away. Um, you see, so, that's very different from my experience. So it's, it's far too easy to extrapolate into making this a male and female thing. Right? I, I'd like to get into a bit of that in a moment. But you, for me, once something's gone, once I've made the painful decision to get rid of it, that's it. I can never, I'll never remember it again. And I think that might be partly just because 
I don't put that much of an emphasis on my clothes. Probably, yeah. <laughs> That's probably the reason why. <laughs> but do you think there is, I mean, we've got to be careful these days, of course, in, in, in stereotyping. We should always have been careful, but there must be some fairly fundamental or generalised differences between men's attitudes to clothes and women's attitudes to clothes. I'm not sure about that. One of the things I discovered um, when I was researching the book, because a, a sort of an element of it is the history of certain items of clothes. And for instance, one of the things I realized as I was writing it was that until relatively recently, by which I probably mean Victorian times, men were the dandies or just as much the dandies as women. I mean, men's clothes and very much earlier were way more ornate than women's clothes. And actually it was only really uh, under Victoria and uh, the Industrial Revolution really that men's clothes began to be more kind of sober and this kind of work uniform of something approaching a suit came in. And then women's clothes sort of carried on becoming ornate. But for instance, you know, the traditional colors of um, pink and blue, pink started off for boys because it was thought of as a more robust color. And I think it was a more robust um, color in paint uh, so that uh, small boys were always the ones dressed or painted in blue and in pink and the girls in blue. So I don't think that there is, um, no, I don't think there is something sort of inherently different. It's probably a bit of a, what is it? A bit of a, a nature nurture. I think it's probably more of a nurture thing that, that men perhaps have been encouraged had to not think that clothes were so important but of course now if you look at what's happening in fashion you'll see that menswear is um is very very creative lots of hugely different ideas and a lot of the new young designers are actually creating non-gender specific collections which slightly appalls me because I don't want men and women to dress identically. <laughs> it sounds so depressing. But this is all sort. Of, this is all a little bit societally driven, isn't it? To some extent. What you mean in terms of the discussion about the gender debate? Well, no, I was just talking more generally about attitudes to clothes. Um. Well, society definitely affects. Um, general attitudes in society affect our personal attitudes to clothes, for sure, absolutely. But I think that men, um, you know, as in a way, men are sort of allowed to be more in touch with their kind of feminine side, perhaps than they had been at certain points. I think, you know, being interested in clothes is, is, is very much part of that. What does it say about me, Alexandra, that if I occasionally drop into an expensive clothes shop in my area of Notting Hill, I'll almost never buy anything from there. I'd far rather go to Uniqlo once a year, get my uniform pieces, and that's it. I, I don't, I'm not sure I have ever worn an item of clothing for its, for its brand. And I, I, I go to a shop and I, I see a 500 pound jumper or something, I think, why would I spend 500 pounds on a jumper? just because of the label, when I, could, when I could spend 150 quid on five jumpers and be perfectly happy. Well, I think that, that's a whole different thing. That's nothing to do with being a man or a woman. I mean, the idea of whether or not you think there is, um, that it's worth it for you personally to spend a lot of money on an item of clothing uh, is a kind of personal choice. I mean, if we say that you've got that sum of money, what you choose to spend it on, you know, whether you might choose to spend it on um, a really good tennis racket or you might choose to spend it on a cashmere sweater, that's a, just a very, very individual choice. I don't think it's a, um, a man-woman thing, although I would agree that probably more men are happy with going into Uniqlo, let's say, let's splash out and say twice a year and, you know, buy six t-shirts and three sweaters and some socks and that, that be it. 
but that's not all men. And, and, and I know women who feel like that as well. I know women who have no interest in going into clothes shops and, and shopping and spending money on clothes. And, you know. Can, can you should... therefore put, put into words the excitement that, that some people, both men and women, feel when it comes to dressing up and, and showing themselves off according to what they're wearing, whether that's a label or just the overall look. Where's the excitement in that? Because I don't, re I don't personally experience it. I'm sure lots of people who are watching do experience it. But how would you describe that? And do you, do you have that yourself? Because I, I remember in the book, I think quite early on in your days as editor-in-chief of Vogue, that the chairman asked you how much money you spent on clothes, I suspect on a, annually. And I think your answer was £4,000, which was a deliberate overestimation on your part because you thought you should say that you spent at least something. And I think he was shocked by how little it was. And the rumour was that he was beginning to wonder whether he'd made the right decision in appointing someone as editor who was spending so little on clothes. Yeah, that's, that, that's for sure. But I don't think that the amount that you spend on clothes is remotely relevant. I mean, it, it's the item of clothing that's important. I mean, I was in Portobello, you know, West London again, like you. Uh, I think last weekend I went to the market for the first time in a long time and was looking around the, um, the secondhand, you know, clothes racks. And I used to wear, I was dressed entirely from those clothes racks under the Westway in West London until I went to Vogue pretty well. I mean, maybe I bought the, I bought the odd other thing for a kind of a smart, uh, a smart suit in the 80s and things like that. But mostly I wore secondhand clothes. And, um, you know, the joy that, that I felt in finding a, a beautiful 1960s kind of cocktail dress uh, that would probably have cost me about eight quid then, and you know putting it on to go to the party that night was you know probably greater actually than the joy i felt in having uh, the most beautiful evening gown made for me for a work event at vogue um i think that it's it's kind of it's it's how you feel about what you're going to do in those clothes that's really important. And whenever I buy something, I have a vision of the life I'm going to live in those clothes, which very, very often has absolutely nothing to do with what my life is. So I, I'm a complete sucker for clothes that do not represent me at all. I have a kind of, I love a kind of, um, a kind of like an artist smock kind of thing, very plain, very utility clothes, big baggy trousers. They look terrible on me because I'm short and I look like a mushroom walking around in them. And they depress my other half no end, I have to say, when he sees me appear in these. But I buy them because I think I'm going to be a person that's going to kind of make pots or I'm going to be a person who's going to paint something wonderful. I'm going to do something very kind of creative and slow and intense with my days that i truly think that that may be what will happen if i buy these clothes i know i know they're not going to do that i know i'm not going to do that but it's a kind of a layer that that goes on and i think a lot of people feel that about clothes you buy a new dress and you think yeah i'm gonna meet somebody nice if i have this new dress or I'm going to go out and the party's going to be really fun in this new dress. It's, I well, don't think I'm the only person that feels that way. There's so many jumping off points. I want to talk to you about creativity. I want to talk to you about the creativity involved in editing Vogue and I don't want to leave gender entirely behind either. But where did this, where did this love of clothes come from in you? I mean, your parents, your grandparents on one side of the family were milliners. I think your grandmother in Toronto and Canada was a milliner. Your grandfather had died appropriately enough in a sense given when we're having this conversation in the Spanish flu of, of 1918. Yeah. Do you, think yeah. that, do you think that love of clothes came from that milliner background? Oh gosh, it's hard to know, isn't it? Because I didn't really know my grandparents, sadly. Well, obviously not Samuel who died when my dad was five. Um, and Ethel, my grandmother, I only met when she was really quite old. She lived across the other side of the world. Um, but 
But both my parents were interested or are interested in clothes. My father's no longer alive, but he was a theater critic. And, you know, he, he was known for being the kind of dandy of the stalls. And he always used to wear um, a fedora or a trilby, a big hat. And in later years, he started to wear these huge kind of coats. And uh, he had a kind of thing for these um, silk scarves that were made by a designer called Georgina von Etzdorf, very kind of patterned silk scarves and he he always liked clothes and my mother um everybody she's 93 now but everyone still admires her style you know so i was brought up in a household where where clothes did matter um and i think that that may have had something to do with it but but i think you develop your own kind of interests it's not really all about your parents and I think I've always loved I've always loved clothes it's, it's clothes not fashion I mean I I'm interested in fashion and I edited Vogue so I now know a lot about fashion and about the business of fashion but it's the clothes it's the actual objects um, I've just always loved them I can't really to analyze why untangle that for us uncouple it the idea of clothes being distinct from fashion well, fashion is, um, fashion is something that moves all the time. Fashion is, uh, it's an idea of what is and is not in fashion. And um, to some extent, this was something I discovered writing the book, that fashion is a kind of, um, it became a way of class differential. So that the idea that if you were the higher born, you wore clothes of a certain kind that uh, the lower born and, and the, the working class did not wear. So people wanted to keep these differentials going. And there's a, um, a psychologist who uh, called J.C. Flugel, who in the 1920s, wrote a book where he pointed out that the notion of fashion is to some extent maintained by the desire to, for the people at the top to keep being able to be seen as at the top. So as soon as the people sort of lower started to emulate them and wear the same clothes, they changed what they were wearing. And so fashion was at that point a kind of top down Thing that started with the aristocracy, I suppose, and moved down. And then what's interesting now is how much fashion actually starts on the street and, you know, has a kind of a trickle up thing. But, you know, there was this fantastic um, story where uh, in the uh, 18th century it was, uh, the um, Duchess of Queensbury, I think it was, went to the Baths Assembly where um, a guy was kind of the master of ceremonies and she had on an apron, she wore an apron over her dress because that was something they were kind of, the posh women were liking to do in a kind of Marie Antoinette way, you know, a little bit of kind of pastoral, rural stuff going into their lives. And he said, you know, basically, you can't come here wearing an apron none but Abigails, and Abigails were ladies' maids, none but Abigails wear aprons. You have to go home and change. And his concern was that if the Duchess started wearing the apron, then who knows, the Abigails might start dressing like duchesses. So interesting to hear you talk about the way fashion started, but how do you think it operates now? You mentioned it being partly, at least, from the street up, as it were. Who do you think really has the power today in fashion? Is it the big designers? Is it what kids are wearing on the street? Is it the, the editors of Vogue? Well, if you'd asked me that question a year ago, I probably would have had a different answer to, to now. I mean, fashion, the fashion business has been hugely affected by uh, the pandemic, not just in the amount that's bought, but in the way that it has kind of um, turbocharged uh, 
a lot of the issues that were already bubbling around about the sustainability, about the, um, the pace of fashion. Did we need so much fashion? Did the fashion industry have to operate the way it does? Did department stores who were very often, particularly the American department stores, drove a lot of the business because they bought more and more and more and demanded more and more new things so that customers would come in and always find something new. Well, the American department stores are crumbling. Um, and one of the things that has sort of, is collectively being realized is that probably there was too much fashion, there was too much being made, there were too many collections. So what's happening now is a really intense look at, um, at how fashion, the fashion business is going to operate. And so the question of who, you, you know, who controls it and who affects it, uh, I think is changing. I think it's perfectly true to say that probably designers, fashion retailers and fashion media, to some extent, did determine what was fashion, what we bought, what was bought into the stores. Um, I'm not sure whether that's going to be exactly the same in a year's time. A year ago, do you feel that someone in your position, or if we go a little further back to when you resigned or retired from, from Vogue in 2017, would you say that editors had, had a huge impact then? I mean, do they still have an impact? I think magazines, uh, Ha had an impact um, in that they were a way to uh, to sort of disseminate the information really to some extent um, obviously when digital came about and uh, particularly actually in the last I would say kind of five years with the growth of Instagram as a kind of device um, for people to be able to show what the collections were instantly to huge amounts of followers including the own, their own, the own brands who used to need the magazines to get out the information. All of that obviously has changed, but I think the idea of an authoritative voice, uh, whether that be Vogue or whether that be Harper's Bazaar or whether that be some fashion influencer who is really trusted by a lot of people, that's still a really important factor that there's so much out there you've got a you need somebody who you believe in to tell you what what you should pay attention to so it's the edit of, is important yeah it's kind of similar isn't it to, to the need for an, an edited news bulletin or an edited mainstream media news website we've got all these different sources pouring in from twitter but we still there's still some sort of appetite for professionals doing the job and and therefore, what you put on the front cover of Vogue when you edit it, and I presume to at least to some extent still what the editors today, Edward Enifel, put on the front cover of, of British Vogue, has an impact. Because who, whom and what you choose to put on your cover is going to, is going to be hugely influential. Yes, I think now more who you put on the cover and less what they're wearing than probably when I first went to Vogue. When I first went to Vogue, you could put relatively unknown model um, on the cover in certain clothes, and those clothes would be the key element of what people were looking at. Now, um, now I think it's much more about who you, who you put on the cover and what message you're giving out by that. Were you very conscious of the messages that you were giving out? Because there, were, there was a lot of politics, there still is a lot of politics in fashion. Um, and I mean politics with a small p. Yeah, uh, well, what you put on the cover, who you put on the cover was, you know, one of the sort of the big roles of the job. Um, you had to, first of all, you had to, in my day, you had to create a cover that people were going to buy. I'm not actually sure that's so true now because people used to go to a magazine shop or, you know, to a newsstand in the street or whatever and hand over money for magazines and now fewer and fewer people are actually doing that so um, to me for me what I was trying to do was create an image that would attract people on a very crowded newsstand 
essentially. Um, I think that's different now. And what people will be doing is they'll, they'll put an image on the cover of the magazine, but basically they're not trying to sell the magazine that way. They're trying to use that statement to roll it out over other elements of the brand. Were you worried at all? Did you, did you, how much consideration did you give at the height of your editorship about body image? Oh, um, a lot. I've always been concerned about body image. I mean, it's something that I think as editor of Vogue, I was very involved in a lot of the conversations that went on about it, particularly about the use of thin models. And I sat on quite a lot of kind of committees talking about it. And I, I was really interested that um, the other day, a, a, a fashion editor who worked with me called Francesca Burns put on Instagram a picture of a, a young model. She was trying to fit into a pair of trousers by Hedy Sliman at Celine, who's always created very small clothes. And she basically put this image up and said, you know, why, why, I've got this really slim girl, lovely girl, why is she being made to feel that she can't fit these clothes? And she's had a huge response to that um, on uh, everywhere, actually, newspapers covered it, uh, Instagram, you know, everywhere, social media. And I wrote a letter 10 years ago to all the designers saying to them, you're putting us in a very difficult position by creating samples, because the samples are what you borrow to put people into in magazines. You create samples that are so small that even the models can't get into them. So it's impossible for us to put anybody other than very, very slim models into these clothes. So how are we meant to show women of all kinds, of all shapes and sizes, and use them as role models if we can't even fit the professional models into your clothes, you know, you've got to do something about it. And I was looking through my files the other day and I saw all these letters that I got back from the designers who were all sounded very sensible and said, you know, we absolutely understand your point. And of course, you know, we have to work with the system and to some extent it's with the models that we're given or it's the photographers want them, blah, blah, blah. But nothing happened. And so it was so interesting to me to see that, you know, 11 years on and exactly the same point is being made. And with a huge reaction, because of course in those days, I wrote a private letter to 50 designers. Fran Burns puts out an Instagram to 30,000 followers, which then goes viral to God knows how many. So you can, you, can, you can get all of this chat, you can get all this conversation happening, but I'll be interested to see whether anything actually changes. Well, and you mentioned social media, and that's a big issue at the moment. I read just yesterday, I think, that someone quite influential was suggesting that people should not be able to use Instagram. I think he was specifically talking about girls, actually, until they're 18, because mm -hmm. of just how negative an impact it can have on them. Yeah, I think social media per se is not a bad thing, like any media per se, it's how it's used, isn't it? And, um, you know, Instagram is a, is a, is a wonderful thing, uh, really fantastic in, in so many ways, but it's not wonderful if you're a 14 year old girl and you're looking at all your images of, of your peer group that have all been filtered and retouched and put out because it is very much on at that level it's very much about my perfect life and actually I know you know women of my age and you know adult women who kind of drive themselves crazy looking at kind of lifestyle Instagrams where everything seems to be perfect, you know, the arrangement on the coffee tail is perfect, somebody's managed to lay the perfect table in the perfect garden with a perfect small child running around, you know, all of that. But, you know, I think at my age, hey, if you don't like him, it, it's making you feel bad, why on earth do it, you know, just get off it, don't, don't follow those people. But if you're a younger, you know, a teenager, I can see that it, it's difficult not to, to get involved with it.
but it's not your... a bad thing per se. I don't think that, you know, Instagram is a bad thing. I don't think that Twitter's a bad thing. It, it's, it's how you react to it and how it's used that, that can be harmful. You mentioned coffee tables and I'm looking at your interior and it looks incredibly stylish and, and beautiful as I would have hoped. And I wonder whether your love of clothes and your interest in clothes and in aesthetics it spills across into interior design and into other areas of your life. Well, what you can't see is there's a crack in front of me. I've got a bay window in front of me. And there's this huge crack that's just come down the whole front of the bay window. Literally looks like it's all about to fall into the garden. So you can't see that. Um, but thanks for being, being nice about um, nice about the room it's actually very cluttered I've always liked stuff and so we have a lot of books for instance the whole of the bats books and we've got books which you also can't see piled up on every surface I mean that the coffee table well you can't quite see it behind me is sometimes this high in books because we've got nowhere to, to put them but um yeah definitely uh my environment has always been very very important to me. My laptop is currently positioned on a whole stack of books, so that my laptop is, is eye level with me as I speak to you. I want to say briefly in my own defence, by the way, having talked about my very conservative uniform, behind me there's quite a lot of colour going on that you may have noticed. Very nice chair. Yeah, and I have been known in the past to, to wear quite extravagant, not in terms of price, but in terms of colour and, and, and look, clothes. And this side of my room is... If you, were, if you were to see it, is, is sort of quite conservative with a small C. And then behind, there are these explosions of colour. So I suppose there are different elements to my personality. And that's the great thing about clothes, isn't it? Because they, they can express different parts of ourselves. Next time we meet, I want you to be in lime green. <laughs> but yes, I mean, I, I think you definitely find that people dress the way that they... Um, decorate their houses or, or the way their houses are. It's very rare that you'll find somebody who has a very minimal home, who kind of, you know, has a real kind of hippy dippy kind of crafty way of, of dressing. And, you know, personally, I'm very schizophrenic. So this room looks like this, but the kitchen out the back is actually, is a very big empty space with just big, one big, window and a table it's kind of empty and the bedroom's kind of something else and the bathroom something else and and my wardrobe is is like that it's um it's completely non-cohesive can we get into a little bit more of the detail of clothes because it, the, the book is littered in a positive way with all sorts of different themes colors for example and then also types of, of clothes i want to ask you briefly about pink I think last time I did a Zoom interview with you for Jewish Book Week, you were wearing pink and you said that pink was a really important colour to you. Why? And, and tell us a bit more about its significance. Because earlier in that conversation, you were saying that pink used to be a male thing. Yeah. I realised writing the book that how, how often um, my favourite clothes are pink. It's not like my wardrobe is stuffed with pink things. But when I was writing about things that meant something to me. They were very often, um, they were very often pink. And I think, you know, well, everybody knows that pink is kind of, is meant to be a kind of um, a joyous color. It's meant to be cheerful. It's meant to, you know, it's uh, the sunsets pink, the flowers are pink, um, all of that. But, What's not quite clear, and, and really, uh, I tried to find out, but I couldn't find out, is whether there is actually something sort of serotonin inducing about pink, and whether or not there is actually something that, that changes your mood around pink or not. And I don't think there is, because some people hate pink. But I thought, well, if, if there was, then, you know, again, in the book, I'm like, well, maybe we should make really depressing things pink so that they cheer us up a bit. I mean, let's have some pink tubes and uh, let's have pink tax demands and things like that. But uh, the pink is, yeah, I found out that a lot of the times where 
you know, like the first date I went on with my now ex-husband, I was wearing a pink dress, I realized. And my first party dress at 13, my grown up party dress was a pink dress. And I often have veered towards, well, I've got a bit of pink on today. I was going to say, there's quite a bit of a smattering of pink in your, in your, in your dress today. From pink to red, and the book starts with, with red shoes. I think, you, I think, if I remember correctly, that, the, that you don't actually currently own a pair of red shoes, but they're nonetheless important and symbolic. Yeah, so it was the first chapter I wrote, in, I wrote at all, and it, turned, and it remained the first chapter of the book, which was red shoes were my sandals, school sandals, childhood sandals. And um, I tell the story of how we used to go uh, as it happened to Harrods because I was brought up in, um, in Belgravia. I was a posh child. And we'd walk across Belgravia, up Sloane Street to Harrods, past the vet with the treacly eyed puppies in the window and into the children's shoe department of Harrods where you would then be measured in those days. Well, I think you are still measured, but you'd be me measured with a kind of tape measure and a sliding rule for the width of your feet. And invariably, the person who measured my feet would say, I'm sorry, madam, but she's a double. I'm afraid, madam, she's a double E. And it was that word afraid that made me realize that double E was not seen as a desirable, to have wide feet was not regarded as a desirable thing to have. And it was I realized my first experience of the question of body image, you know, and, and how what people said could make you feel about your feet. So I had to wear these kind of round toed, um, start right sandals, my red shoes. But my best friend Jane had narrow feet and she could wear nice pointy toed, red toed sandals. So that was kind of, I used the idea of red shoes to uh, my sandals to really write about how body image starts very young. You, you mentioned body image and, and in the book you write quite a bit about appearance and expectations actually specifically of your appearance as Ed's true or foe. Was that a big thing? Did you feel a pressure to look a certain way, to conform in any way? I think when you, um, if you get a job like editing Vogue, you, you have to be aware of the fact that how you look is something people are going to notice and um, comment on. And very early on, I was 34 when I became editor of Vogue. And very early on then, I'd always been perfectly happy with the way I looked actually. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't, it had any great insecurities about the way I looked, but it was obvious that people kind of didn't think that I looked like a person, um, who was editing Vogue and I could see what other Vogue editors looked like and, and, and not just Anna Winter, there are a lot of, you know, a lot of Vogue editors and they were mainly much more kind of soigné and slimmer and um, fashionably dressed than was my nature. And I, I kind of made a decision very early on to kind of stick to myself because I thought if I try to be like that, it's not me. and I know that when you try and be something that you aren't, that's when the problems start. That's when you start becoming very insecure about who you are. So I did make a kind of decision that I was going to be, try and be as much me as I possibly could, whilst obviously, you know, hopefully looking like, I, you know, I had some interest in clothes and fashion and, you know, appeared to be, part of um, the world I was working in. But it did make me laugh that, you know, even by like, I'd, uh, I don't know, I'd edited it for 23 years or something or other, people would interview me, you know, come and interview me for a piece and they'd sit down and one of the first things they invariably said was, you know, I have to say, it's, you know, it's so interesting, but you don't really look like somebody who edits Vogue. And I'd be like, hang on, I've edited both for 23 years. What does this person look like? It's a very good response. I, I, I imagine that, well, I don't know, given what you said about how involved in fashion men increasingly are, and I suppose we are, 
but I, I, I do nonetheless wonder whether Edward Enifel has to put up with those sorts of comments. Well, I, I make that point in the book. I say, you know, one of the things I, can't, I couldn't resist saying is, you know, I don't notice people talking about what Edward looks like or the size that he is, or, you know, they might say what he's wearing, but nobody attaches anything to that um, in the same way that they do to a woman. None of this stopped you from, well, none of this meant that you shied away from donning a Chanel jacket from time to time, which is a kind of signature outfit, isn't it? It almost screams editor of Vogue. Yeah, and the Chanel jacket is one of the few items of, I think the only desi named designer item that has a chapter of its own in it, because it was so much part of the fashion industry, the idea that you could wear a Chanel jacket because they're fabulously expensive and they so signal that, you know, that you are a certain kind of person if you wear a Chanel jacket. I mean, either you've been given a Chanel jacket by somebody um, or you earn enough money to be able to pay for a Chanel jacket. And, but they also make you feel very, um, pulled together you're not you don't kind of flop around in a in a chanel jacket and um yeah it was it, it i realized that i had i got given two when i when i went to vogue and sadly i don't have either of them now because they they hit the charity shop floor but i've still got three that over the years that i did have and in fact i was looking at one of them the other day and it's so extraordinary but in all the time I had it, and I probably got it about 10 years ago, I never noticed that, in fact, it's got the most beautiful kind of purple thread through it. I'd only seen it as being gray and white. And then I noticed for the first time looking at it, that it had purple in it. And I think, how, how come I didn't notice that? I'll tell you what, I'll strike you a deal, Alexandra. Next time we meet, I'll, I'll wear lime green if you wear your Chanel jacket. Okay, I'll try. You'll have to explain that's why I'm wearing it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I want to move from red shoes and Chanel jackets to white blouses, to white shirts in a second. But before I do, this is an important question I haven't asked it yet. What was it actually like editing Vogue for 25 years? Well, oh God, what was it like? I mean, that's a book in itself. Um, it was fantastic. It was... Um, to, to be in charge of a magazine that has that kind of um, powerful a voice and is that recognized was, you know, uh, I mean, a real privilege. Um, and it was very exciting that when you put something in it or you did an interview with somebody um, or you put, you know, we put a lot of weight behind a certain kind of trend that people would pay attention to it. So that was amazing. And also working with, you know, the best creative people in the world was wonderful. And we worked with, you know, fantastic photographers, fantastic um, writers, often artists, which were terrific, obviously the designers. Um, so that's, you know, that's very fulfilling to, to have all of that coming into your life every day. Obviously, it was a job and it's a big business and my business was to make money and you know i had to run a quite a big team and so there's a lot of uh a lot of dealing with people a lot of i i think that was what i would say was the main part of the job was trying to to get the best out of everybody you know the people who work for me in the office but also the people that were contributing outside and kind of keeping everybody happy. You're juggling a, a lot of balls when you, you edit Vogue. But, um, you know, it wasn't always wonderful. There were, there were horrible moments when maybe uh, I'd, you know, somebody had done something that I really didn't like and you'd have to tell them that or somebody had behaved badly or um, you couldn't you know you couldn't you were fighting for something that you couldn't get that, those kind of things but but in the main it, it was wonderful. What sort of editor 
were you? I mean, you probably say I should ask your former staff, but were you a facilitator? Were you very didactic in the way that you edited the paper? And also, it's a slightly separate part of the question, but how much editorial freedom did you have from the proprietor? And how distinct were you from American Vogue? I mean, what sort of relationship did you have with Anna Winter? Quite a lot of questions packed in. Yeah, again, again, a lot of questions there. Um, as an editor, I think I saw myself as a facilitator. Um, or a conductor, really, and to me, how how I edited the magazine was to um, to kind of put together I ideas uh, that I thought would make an interesting package to try and get different voices in to get sort of different weight of ideas. I I always liked the idea that you could go really in depth on something very trivial. So, you know, I'd love to do an article on kind of um, dry cleaning or, um, you know, the journey of a dress where one dress went, one sample size dress went over, you know, a month or something like that. And then maybe sometimes really sort of big things treat in quite a light way. Um, I've always thought that was quite an interesting way to approach things and uh, I know my staff always said they knew where they were with me and that was um, I would tell them you know what what I thought I didn't always um, I think I'm fairly decisive but you know I could change my mind so you know I'd, I'd have an opinion but I think everybody well it struck seemed to me that they all felt perfectly capable of coming in and arguing their case and I might change my mind. Um, and editorial independence? Did you did you have free reign as editor? Yeah, I did. I had free reign. I was really lucky. I was given the job, um, and I have to say, Nicholas Coleridge, who was my immediate boss, you know, over twenty five years. I think there were maybe three times where he kind of got involved in some decision that I'd made about something or. Uh, maybe said he wanted something different. So I definitely had um, editorial freedom. Having said which, I knew what it was that they wanted me to do and I did it. So I wasn't, um, you know, I was doing things that I knew would be commercially successful. I was doing things that I thought would sell the magazine. I wasn't going off on one of possibly my own hobby horses or some kind of down some recherche rabbit hole that I might have been really interested in exploring. I didn't, didn't, the magazine was not a reflection of all of my own preoccupations, although, you know, some of them it did reflect. And Anna Winter, did you, did you guys hang out? Anna, um, well, the oddly thing about Anna is that she, her dad edited the Evening Standard when my father was the editor critic, so there was a kind of Winter Shulman connection early on. Uh, not that I knew her before getting the job. And um, we, we also know quite a few of the same people sort of outside the fashion world. But no, we, don't ha we didn't hang out, but we always got on perfectly well. And actually, when I, when I left, um, she sent me the nicest emails, you know, when I resigned. And, um, and in fact, when the new editor was a appointed, she sent me a very sweet email um, as well. So, um, you know, I, I have a lot of time for Anna and I think, you know, doing her job now is kind of a nightmare, but... You were obviously very aware Alexandra, of what American Vogue was up to, but did you try to sort of define yourself against what it was doing or broadly align yourself with what it was doing? I think American Vogue and British Vogue were quite similar. We were, uh, American Vogue was more um, monotone, I would say, than British Vogue was quite eclectic in terms of the fashion we put in, um, in terms of the kind of writing we would have. But I think Britain is more eclectic. You know, we, we are somewhere that has our culture, uh, our popular culture is very kind of broad. Uh, America was, American Vogue is much more a reflection of kind of, you know, Anna's personal style, 
um, a certain kind of very clear definition of what was chic, what was fashionable, and all of that. But, you know, there were a lot of other Vogue's. I mean, I think there are 24 now, but there were at least sort of 15 through most of the time I was at Vogue. And I think probably American Vogue and Indian Vogue, oddly enough. Indian Vogue is very like British Vogue because the editor came to London to sort of train a bit and, and use British Vogue as a template. We're running out of time, so I'm going to finish with this sort of quick fire round because there's so many questions that I, I could still ask you, would love to ask you. But just firstly, and so just be as brief as you possibly can in your answers so we can cover as much territory as we can. Okay. I, I remember I'm just left LBC now and, and, and after four years of presenting overnight shows because I just wanted to get my sleep back and kind of be more in sync with the rest of the world. I haven't regretted it for a second. I'm sure I'll miss the audience. I'm sure I'll miss some of the buzz, but I want to go back into radio and TV again. But I, I remember after stopping making documentaries at the BBC a while ago, I really missed the creative, the visually creative element of that. And so I turned to photography and eventually to nature photography to fulfill that. And it's been a hugely important part of my life. And I wonder, having given up that job in, in 2017, First of all, what was it like psychologically to give something up as I just had? But also, do you miss the creativity of putting a magazine together, of making it look fantastic? Well, as you will know, when you give up something and you choose to give it up, actually you feel euphoric. It's so lovely, it's freeing, and you've got this huge sense of opportunity about different things you can do. So that's how I felt and still feel about it. Do I miss the creativity? I miss the idea that I could go out now and have an idea and I can come back and I could say, let's do a story on X. And you know, in six weeks later, there'll be a story on it. I miss having, having the ability to do that. But you know, I write a column for the Mail on Sunday, it gives me an opportunity to say some things that I want to say and you know, can write books. So. And if, if, I, if I see a story that I think, oh, that would be good for my listeners, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to them about that on Friday or Saturday evening. I can always put it on Twitter for the moment as a sort of yeah. interim fit. I promise the, the, the white shirt or the white blouse, significance of that in a couple of sentences? Uh, white shirt is kind of the perfect way of uh, well-known women saying... I am just like you. And I really noticed that you see people like the Duchess of Sussex often uses a white blouse when she wants to look very kind of down home. And, um, you know, professional women will often wear a white shirt in their kind of press shots because it makes you look very kind of no nonsense and competent. So, um, yeah, white shirts have a lot. I, I wrote a lot about the white shirt. Little black cocktail dress. LBD, bit of a cliche of an idea, but um, still the thing that people, I think probably it's the acronym that most people attach to, to fashion. Indigo is a colour. Indigo is a cover, one of my favourite colour. Favorite color. color. Yeah. yeah, one of my favourite colours. And um, it's such a, it's a very rare dye. And uh, there's something about it which is slightly indefinable so that, uh, you have to listen to um, Mood Indigo, and that's an oral, an oral depiction of... Is that Nina Simone? No, it's Charlie Mingus. Although I think she may have done a cover. There's no words. Oh, but she did sing a song with the word Indigo in it, Nina Simone. Okay, I'm going to look that up. Let's look it up afterwards. Navy, Navy. Navy, uh, yeah, I call it the St. Christopher's of the wardrobe, always able to get you safely to where you want to go. Um, I wear a lot of navy, totally practical, lovely, no nonsense, not as gloomy as black, but, you know, it's fail safe. Double denim? <laughs> double denim, I love a bit of double denim. It's so kind of Charlie's Angels. And, and tell me about... Handbags early years. I think you did you say you had 30? You discovered you had 35 handbags. Handbags are something that men don't have, and the attachment that a lot of women have to their handbags 
I don't, I'm not sure is replicated in, in, in men's fashion or in men's everyday experiences. But is there a male version of the handbag? Have I got well, that First wrong? of all, more and more men are carrying, as it were, handbags. They just happen to be backpacks, so they're carrying them on their back. And also the man bag slung across your, you know, like the uh, courier bag, men are carrying them. I don't think they carry them with the same kind of uh, stuff of the day that women do, you know. And the reason why women had to is because they, they didn't have pockets in their clothes for a long time and pockets were attached to their clothes. And it was only when they started to actually be able to go and travel on their own and go and work that the handbag became something that they were attached to. And you really notice like now, in, during this pandemic time when people have been going out less, tons of people aren't carrying handbags because they're not really going anywhere. Jewelry. Jewelry, jewelry is so interesting because it's it's it hasn't changed its relevance in society at all from the very earliest moments jewelry existed um, to now. And jewelry's, I think it's so interesting because it's such an again such an emotional thing. Jewelry, you know, it's not about the price of the jewelry; it's about who gave it to you and what it represents you don't look it remotely but you're 62 and yet you feel i think you said in the book you feel like you're, or maybe you've just said this before that you feel like you're a 25 year old and i wonder how important or otherwise it is to dress in a way that is in sync with one's age um i think you have to dress in sync with yourself so it depends how you feel about about the age you are i mean i do really think that you can wear what you want to wear. You have to accept the fact that other people might think that you look kind of odd in it or it doesn't look great on you. I mean, the important thing is that you like what it is, but people are always going to have their opinion and, and they have to be able to. Can we finish with an uplifting message, if there is one, about the sort of fun that we should continue to have with our clothes and, and how we look as we as we continue to deal with this pandemic yeah i think that it's you know the clo clothes are the thing that we put on every day you know they're part of our daily life we can't really escape our clothes so we may as well have as much fun with them and get as much pleasure out of them as we possibly can i mean i don't think it doesn't matter if what you choose to do is wear a pair of pajamas every day but, you know, if that's what you're doing, make sure you enjoy those pyjamas. Alexandra Shawman, it's been so good to spend this time with you. Thank you for, for joining us. And thank you to everybody who's tuned in to watch and, and listen to this event today. Please do continue to support the Harrogate Festivals. They're a really important part of the lifeblood of this country from a cultural perspective. It's been such fun, Alexandra. I'm going I'm to reconsider my navy blue uniform, but I, I, I suspect the next time we meet, I probably will be in blue. Unless you give me the heads up, you're going to wear that Chanel jacket, and then I will turn up in line. Okay, group. it's a deal. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks.